and Dr. Ruth Calloway of Swansea University will be talking to us about um, applying applied research and I'll then be handing over to Ruth to chair the, uh, the next session which will be stakeholder perspectives on the EcoStructure project. Over to Ruth. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. So we, we are getting into the after coffee afternoon session, and I know it can be increasingly of tiring to listen to us, so, but I can promise you that we are trying to make it as interesting and entertaining and engaging as possible. This session is now going to be about applying the research that has been done in ecostructure. And two weeks ago, I went to uh, the Flood and Coast Conference ex exhibition, and I found myself talking to concrete specialists about how we can make concrete greener, the pros and cons of pre-casting, and how much concrete you need in front of the rebar if you want to build a seawall. And I had to mentally step back and thought, I'm a benthic ecologist. I'm really interested in marine tube worms. What am I doing here? So how did it come to this? And my feeling is, is that if we as a community are serious about wanting to widen eco-engineering, wanting to upscale and broaden the concept, then that is what we have to do. We have to get out of our comfort zone, engage with sectors that we have actually very little idea about and try to understand much better what, what they are about, their concerns and their views. And for that reason, I'm very pleased and honored that today we have actually three of our stakeholders, of our non-academic stakeholders, that give us the time and share with us after I've got done a bit of an introduction of what we've done in EcoStructure, they share with us their experience with this project. And the application, the, the broadening of, 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 the, of our research results is really woven into the fabric of the Interact Island Wales funding program. If you look at really what the purpose is, it is the purpose is to address common economic, environmental and societal challenges. So it is really from the start, it was our duty and our remit to apply what we were doing here about applying the research. And there are a number of objectives and tasks in ecostructure that try to, to step up the upscaling, the commercialization, the wider application. So in the first part of ecostructure, we looked at some of the views of key decision makers. This morning you heard from Joe about Kieran's and Atea's work in upscaling of academic scale form liners and panels. We have worked on engaging with stakeholders in eco-engineering product development. And Elise, of course, told us about an example how to engage with stakeholders. The University of Cork is producing a review of policies and laws linked to eco-engineering. And we're just before the break, we heard from Thomas about the assessment of uh, the cultural values and eco cultural ecosystem services. Maria Troya from UCC did, um, so all, did a questionnaire about the, the barriers in of implementing and widening eco-engineering among non-academic stakeholders and produced um, some of these word clouds. And it came up that cost was seen as one of the, the greatest barrier. It comes up time and time again, never mind what kind of stakeholder you are talking to. But there are really a list, a long list, a raft of other factors, really factors that have very little to do with modeling or ecology so that are seen as potential barriers, risks to, to applying eco-engineering to coastal infrastructure. 
for instance, that there is sort of little knowledge, little guidance, that it is just perceived as perhaps a risk to the engineering integrity. And I made an attempt a bit sort of inspired by Mike Elliott's horrendograms to just look at the plethora of factors that can all be make or break factors and their interactions. And these factors, they come from very different sectors. Of course, you know, there is at the center, there is the ecology, but there is a factors like planning, the aesthetics, construction issues, health and safety. And all of these factors are crucial if we want to upscale the academic eco-engineering concept to, to an entire infrastructure project, if you like. And if you look at what, what did we deal with really mostly in eco-structure, then of course it was mostly producing and finding evidence in terms of the ecology. In Dublin, they, Kieran and Atea worked on form liners and manufacturing and on the composition of concrete. And we also had some, some community work, some work on, work on law and regulation, but there are really a large number of factors that really in ecostructure we didn't deal with that much. I want to just take now a few minutes to talk about uh, the review on law and regulation. Um, Catherine and Maria who uh, from Cork who did this would have liked to give a presentation on their work on, on this review, but uh, they couldn't make it today. And also, so I, I must say, I would have loved if we could have launched this review today. But Kevin said that just at the moment, there is some new policy coming into play, particularly in Ireland, and they wanted to include that in their review, so we have to wait a little longer. But some key insights were that they were saying so the strongest legislative drivers for eco-engineering remains EU environmental legislation like the, the Habitats Directive. They are just, it's just the most, what they say, TT regulation. It gives the best tools for regulators to promote biodiversity net gain, biodiversity offsetting. And then there is national law in Ireland and in Wales that is quite different. In Ireland, you have sort of a number of different acts that make uh, provisions for the execution of coastal protection schemes for carrying out urgent works sort of at infrastructure. And there is a planning hierarchy. So it starts at the highest level, um, at the national level, with, um, with, with uh, national planning frameworks, and then it cascades down to the local level with local area plans. And all of that is underpinned by a number of uh, statements and strategies that, that support sort of the, this, the policies and the framework. In Wales, we also have a set of um, laws and of acts that promote and guide um, eco-engineering, uh, so like the Flood and Water Management Act. We have in Wales an, a separate issue in that we have, of course, UK-wide legislation, but then we additionally have Wales-specific legislation. For instance, so of the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act and one of the goals of the Future Generations Act is a resilient Wales and the promotion of biodiversity is one of, it is included in corp nested in this resilient Wales goal. We also have the Environment Act Wales from 2016 and actually last year in England there was a similar Environment Act passed. Nonetheless, of the feedback from the stakeholders was that these pieces of legislation, they say all the right things, but 
or the regulator, it can be sometimes too vague to, to really apply these laws into regulation. So we have, so as I said, so a number of other factors other than those that of more practical um, factors to do with planning and manufacturing construction that we have to consider. And we try to do that by carrying out workshops and meetings with really a whole list of stakeholders from very different sectors. And the form of this type of engagement varied quite a lot. It varied from sort of small groups or one-to-one -one meetings, and there could be sort of workshops where we have were like creative workshops where we tried to exchange ideas, come up with solutions, try to discuss the hurdles and the barriers to certain ideas. We had a number of field visits where we looked at existing projects or we, we went, for instance, to Paul's call to look at a large construction project and took the opportunity to talk with these construction teams about eco-engineering and what possible um, sort of, uh, hurdles there, there could be and how, how they, they could be solved. And, um, and then we visited uh, conferences and events to talk with sector spe specialists. We also carried out or did a really quite a high level workshop where we brought people together from um, government, from regulators, the wider community, from industry and academics and spoke broadly about what people perceived or what people wanted for the future of, of coastal community and what they perceived to be the greatest threats. And, for us in ecostructure, it was interesting and to see where does this the thread where, where does infrastructure rank in comparison to, for instance, water quality or social cohesion. And um, it was perhaps not such a surprise that some of these more imminent factors well, like water quality ranked a lot higher than eco-engineering. To me, for me the most successful engagement was bringing together people for very specific projects. This is the, the project is the, the Mumble Sea Hive project and we brought together sort of everybody who had a personal professional interest in that, in that subject, in that project that they, they could benefit or they could also voice their, the risks they, they were seeing. And I, I always felt that the quality of the engagement and the quality of the discussion was best when it was at this, this project level with about say 10 to 20 people who, who were affected by this. So this was I said, the, the Mumble Sea Hive project and the the commercialization thinking and aspect, the upscaling thinking behind that was that we had the scientific evidence about textured panels and we tried to find commercially available pan panels, form liners already and, and tried them so in this experiment. We also um, organized of community events. So we spoke with over 200 school children and gave us the opportunity to talk about sea level rise and climate change and biodiversity. And then the children, they created their own panels and drawings and, and really were very easy to engage. But we didn't only want to talk with children, we also had community events where um, at a local market together with the environmental community engagement officer. We set up a stall at the local market and it allowed us to, of course, explain to people, to the community, to residents, to visitors, what eco-engineering is, what this particular project is about. But important for us, it was also to get the feedback from the residents to really understand 
how important it is, what people were thinking, what they like to see in the future. And of course, what they like to see in the future, that is now the next step. So we, this experiment, the Manuel Seahive experiment is now about a year old and it, it's coming to its end. And now we are at the point where we have to make a decision what is going to happen at the entire evil restoration level. And so two months ago, we had a workshop, the first face-to-face -face workshop, again after COVID, um, where we again brought all the stakeholder from construction and manufacturing and form liner um, designing and um, which was there, the community engagement officer uh, was there. So a lot, a number of academics from engineering, from biosciences, to, to really discuss so to what have we learned from this experiment now in our different sectors and where can we go from here? And again, it was a discussion, I think we were about 15 people and that group size worked well. And uh, just in the, the coffee break, um, Thomas was saying sort of how important and how, how, how great it is to meet again in person, how much more productive it can be. And I had a very similar impression at this meeting, at this workshop, that just being together in the same room opened up of a level or a depth of discussion that I feel that perhaps on Zoom we couldn't have achieved. Importantly, we had a presentation by um, the NRW officer, Kerry Bynan Davis, who was telling us about the new guidance note that NRW is producing. Because of course, in ecostructure, a number of absolutely fantastic tools have been developed, but their feedback, their internal feedback had shown that some of the practitioners still felt that the type of guidance that was available was, was not quite of the nature that they needed to really apply some of these interventions that we were um, suggesting. And they, NRW commissioned um, this new guidance document. And I guess quite a few of us in ecostructure may have commented on so first drafts of this, this guidance note. And I think that will be an important stepping stone to really the, the broadening and the upscaling of these um, eco-engineering interventions. So where do we wanna go? So at the Flood and Coast Conference, there was um, the, the, one of the winners um, during the conference was the Porty project at the UK South Coast, where they had managed really to upscale uh, a pattern that was uh, developed by in Glasgow by Larissa Naylor. And you can see sort of how excited people are about this kind of project. And it took a lot of time and a lot of tenacity and hard work, I understand, to get this realized, this project, but uh, they got there and they, they certainly reaped the benefits. And my feeling is that this is the kind of project that we need more of in Ireland, in Wales, and then we can create some momentum in, in upscaling eco-engineering. And to do that, of course, we need not the academics, first and foremost, but we need the practitioners. And with that, I want to hand over now to um, our stakeholders. Okay, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Um, so just, just a very quick presentation about how uh, ecostructures reach the other parts, other projects couldn't um, for Natural Resources Wales. Um, just to say, I, I used to work for NRW, uh, I finished at the end of March and I managed a team of marine specialists who provided advice uh, and, uh, on uh, big um, marine constructions and projects. So just a little bit about NRW's role and remit. Um, NRW has three main roles. It's a statutory advisor to government, it's a regulator and it's also a landowner and manager of land 
including marine areas such as the Dee and the Burry Inlet in Wales. So we also, uh, with the lead development and coordination body for the marine area statement, uh, as uh, has already been mentioned, um, with the lead for the delivery of sustainable management of natural resources under the Environment Act, uh, we have many uh, flood assets that we manage ourselves. Uh, we provide statutory advice to developers uh, on um, their developments and aspects as far as this project is concerned on things like enhancements and non-native species. We also have statutory responsibility for protected sites, advising on compensation for developments, for example, and uh, loss of habitats. When I say we, I mean they. Sorry. <laughs> Um, so just really to step back a few years, um, one, of the, our, one of NRW's big issues really is in terms of giving statutory advice and advice on projects is a lack of evidence, or was a lack of evidence. Uh, so in advising on a, on a construction project, you know, and whether it can go ahead, evidence is absolutely key. If we don't have that evidence, then um, our advice is much more uncertain and the outcomes are let, you know there's less chance of that project being licensed so evidence is absolutely key uh, in in us being able to provide that certainty so how has uh, ecostructure helped nrw it's strengthened the evidence base regarding effective interventions supporting policy targets marine planning processes and reducing barriers to implementation. It, it's supported evidence-based decision-making, which is really, really important in terms of, you know, the effectiveness of the designs, you know, how some of these structures affect the spread of non-natives. It, it, it's produced, as we saw earlier, the Conservation Evidence website, which is a fantastic detailed one-stop resource for our advisors in terms of knowing what works and therefore having more certainty in our advice. Uh, it, it also has aid, aided decision around um, what sort of mitigation is needed and what interventions are needed. As I said, it's reduced risk and uncertainty. Those are the sort of key messages. Again, it's helped us in producing these, these tools. Uh, I've only listed a few here, so uh, but, but each of these tools is being used by staff in NRW to help us to give that advice and guidance. us very much in understanding how to engage with stakeholders uh, about things like eco-engineering. Some of the work that's been done on engagement has really been groundbreaking for us in terms of understanding how to how to reach people and and and, and how to do that 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 kind of research. It, it's it's helped us in term it's helped NRW in terms of uh, supporting us for it, supporting NRW in INS management, particularly around DVEX in Holyhead, uh, and it's. Um, contributed uh, valuable information in terms of uh, our marine evidence priorities. But overall, it's increased our confidence in the outcomes and, it, and having greater confidence in the outcomes gives us greatest policy buy-in and therefore better delivery. Just to say thank you. And what's the next project, please? I know Pip was talking earlier about you know, how much is enough and you've done those projects where you've looked at how you cluster things like rock pools, but how much is enough? If you've got a whole new sea wall, how many rock pools do you have to put on there to actually make a difference? Lots of other things, but that's certainly one of the ones that came up for me. And a very big thank you to all of you for, for such a, a really good project and, and good luck with what comes next. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to speak here today. Um, it's been it's been wonderful to be um, part of um, your amazing energy and enthusiasm and doing what you do. Um, and it's also been an incredible journey for us as well. Um, we we were asked um, a couple of years ago to um, to be part of a, a project, which is the Mumbles project. I'll just introduce myself first. Sorry, I'm Charlie Feline from Cubex, and um, I'm the founder of Cubex. Um, and our journey started a couple of years ago with eco-engineered um, um, marine projects when we were invited to by our uh, mold-making company called Reckley um, to um, create molds for a for a project for the Mumble Seawall. 
um, at which stage we um, met Ruth um, and we um, sorry. Um, at which stage we met Ruth and we, we then took our expertise, which is we specialize in ultra high performance concrete and we make um, bespoke visual concrete um, elements, mostly facades for architectural um, projects. Um, and these are a couple of jobs that we've done. Um, you can see the, the texture. Um, the, these are made from ultra high performance concrete into rubber molds. Um, so when we were initially invited to um, when we were initially invited to um, work on the, the Mumble Seawall, um, Ruth had sent us um, some uh, oyster shells and, uh, and a very detailed drawing of, um, of the natural native seaweed um, that is found in the Mumbles area. Um, and she asked us to create molds. So we, we initially started off by um, with a textured surface, which you can see um, underneath the, the seaweed there. Um, and I'll just play this little video for you, which uh, is a good of, of the sort of detail that's involved in, in making the, the mold. We took actual the actual oysters and we laid them onto a textured surface and then we used clay um, to make the um, to make the seaweed from um, from the drawings that Ruth had given us. Um, so our brief really was our internal brief was to to think like a fish um, and to basically make it so that it was attractive for for marine life. Um, the left hand image is one of um, the rubber being poured into the into the made um, mold, which is the sort of the master mold. So we pour the rubber over the oyster shells, over the clay, um, and then we basically demold it, and we ended up with these um, structures over here, um, which are basically um, rubber molds. We we took um, patterns from the Reckley pattern book, um, which were standard architectural patterns, in fact, but which um, Ruth had chosen, um, which she felt would work well in attracting and enhancing and uh, uh, creating habitats for marine life. Um, here's another video of us removing the rubber from uh, the pattern that we that you saw, saw just now. Um, so basically, um, the rubber is polyurethane rubber, so it's, it's, um, it's got a, a good shore hardness um, and we're able to get at least 100 pulls, so you, allow, you can make 100 molds from each, um, 100 panels, tiles from each, each mold, essentially. On the right, um, the right picture is the production of the, of the panels um, for the sea, sea hive, which are already made um, and which are basically ready for shipping. Um, the installation uh, was undertaken by a subcontractor in, um, in Wales. Um, and basically, we we attach the um, the tiles to the seawall by by gluing them with a cementitious marine grade um, adhesive, um, and then stainless steel bolts, which were then placed at um, three points on the on each on each hexagon panel. Um, that's the one of we we had we placed them in three locations. That's one of the locations. I um, mean, this was this this location, in fact, because it's slightly protected. Um, gave us the best results in terms of um, the marine life that's attached itself to it. Um, this is a, this is a, this is the, these are the pa panels currently, and these are them when they were freshly installed. Um, so lessons, we we placed some of the the locations. One of the th three locations was a direct hit to the sea, so um, there's very little activity on that because the wave action is is absolutely direct onto the onto the panels, but from a from our point of view, from the concrete point of view, we wanted to see how the the, the panels would cope with the with the wave action. Um, we realised that texture um, and water retention um, were important parts of um, attracting marine life, and we also worked out that we also found out that the the orientation of the of the of the panels so was also very important. So obviously having them in a linear um, in a linear um, pattern meant that um, um, sideways from left to right meant that um, little shelves were created for marine life to, to creep, stay, be on top or underneath. And so um, 
we've um, the opportunities that um, have sort of developed from us as a as a concrete company is that we um, as an ultra high performance concrete company we make um, very thin concrete um, which is incredibly strong our concrete is six times stronger than um, than normal concrete so it means that we can make um, we can use less concrete less cement to make these structures um, which is a good thing in itself and um, we make incredibly strong structures which means that they last a long time so you don't want to be replacing um, you know structures from you know on a regular basis so they're there to last um, they can be bolted onto existing seawalls so you don't have to rebuild seawalls um, they can be um, all the cracks and expansion joints in the seawall can be um, can be um, uh, worked around so that we can put panels around them and um, so that they don't affect the panel that's stuck over them in other words breaking them um, and we've been um, incredibly privileged also to be part of the EcoStructure project in the sense that um, we've we've been asked to do the uh, mold work for um, uh, the project that um, Paul and Joe mentioned earlier on in the Dublin Harbour. Um, and we're busy making those molds at the moment and they'll be deployed into the ocean in terms of blocks um, and in terms of um, tiles that will go on um, Dublin Harbour. Um, we've also been um, through Ruth, we've been introduced to the um, engineering department at Swansea University, and we're working on them with um, with making um, new mixed designs, which obviously suit the marine environment, which um, which we've used um, uh, waste material or um, bio material from other industries, which is both sustainable and it's um, it's scalable. So we don't want to use materials that are just going to run out in a couple of months' time, but we've managed to source materials that we can actually put into our into our mixed design, thereby reducing the amount of cement, thereby reducing the amount of you know CO2 emissions. So from our side, it's been a, a wonderful environmental learning curve as well, is to be part of something that um, is so focused on, on doing good. We've also formed a, a new company called Blue Cube Marine, which is basically going to focus on just doing marine structures. Um, and I think for us all, um, personally, it's been a wonderful journey. It's been an eye opener to to be involved with um, uh, with with doing talks at schools and seeing getting kids involved with um, not only the concrete making, um, but also in, involved with the sort of the marine marine part of of what concrete can actually do. Um, so, and that's um, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much, and thanks for inviting me today. So it's been a real privilege to to be part of this. Um, um, conference. Um, I just wanted to show you this is a, a project we're working on at the moment. It's um, it's a Sabellaria reef. Um, so we've made the the concrete piece um, from from rubber, um, and we're going to deploy these onto a project at Porth Call, where we've created a, um, a, a sort of a, a, a pool, um, a series of um, uh, pools. Um, with um, hexagon shapes um, on a flat bed. So basically, um, we'll, we'll be creating sort of open areas, which will then create um, lovely um, sea pools. Um, and, and hopefully with the, with the texture that we've managed to achieve on the, on the concrete elements, um, we'll be able to sort of attract a lot of um, new marine life to that, that project. Thank you very much. I'm James from Arup. So if you don't know us, we're an international um, consultancy. Um, my background is a civil engineer. Um, and today I'm going to um, I've chosen to to speak to you um, a bit around the stakeholder feedback um, we've received over the last um, six, six months while we've been working with NRW on a guidance note for ecological enhancement of coastal structures and kindly uh, Ruth and Gabe have both mentioned that already and and given it a plug so that saves me from from having to do that but just to start off with that um, note um, what what is it um, it, it was really um, you know the, the key aims were around raising awareness of of the topic you know, outside um, you, you know, the usual, the, the, the academic and, and eco structure circle with the practitioners and, and people who are going to implement this on larger scale projects. Um, so it, was, it really had a focus on implementation and, and taking some of the small scale trials and the great research that, that's been done um, in, into that larger scale projects. So what, what have we produced? We've produced two key 
um, parts to that. One is um, a guidance note, um, so that, that's a that's a report. But then probably more, you know, um, in, in some ways more useful is a, is a training toolkit, which is visual, pre-recorded, and can be used to to give a half hour or or an hour um, session um, to people who might have no experience of of this subject before. Um, but might be you know, heavily involved in maintaining seawalls um, or, or construction. Um, so both of those are, are soon to be launched um, on the NRW um, and the Arab websites, and hopefully you'll all see those um, publicised on social media. But as I say today, I'm, I'm just going to talk about we, we held a lot of workshops and one-to-ones with um, various stakeholders, so regulators, asset owners, um, other other consultants, contractors, really to get a broad range um, of of opinions and to identify barriers, but also more importantly, what actions could be taken to 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 allow the more widespread um, use. So just this slide just gives a um, some examples of of what that training toolkit looks like. You know, we we go through the the drivers why we're doing this. Um, we, we then have a 12 step guide in, in again laid out in quite simple terms so that someone can pick this document up and understand the steps they need to go through um, from from having the vision to to provide some ecological enhancement right through to the construction and the monitoring stages. Um, so in there as well, you know, again, there's some pictures and, and graphics you would expect just explaining again what type of structures um, th these can be applied to and, and some of the techniques that were out there. So what did we hear from, from some of the, the stakeholders? Um, I think some of these have been mentioned before, you know, what, what are the key barriers? Uh, obviously um, resources, people, people and costs and budgets um, were, were mentioned, um, but you know perhaps um, another area that, that was mentioned a lot was, you know, actually the teams in these organisations don't have experience, they don't have qualifications, they, they feel that it's an emerging area and it's, it's not, it doesn't yet concern them yet. There was also um, a, an interesting um, comment made a few times around the perception of communities. You know, sometimes communities are, are asking why um, are um, local authorities spending money on, on this type of work rather than, than reducing flood risk. And if we move on to the central um, you know, column, a lot of these stakeholders were, were finding it hard. They, they knew the legislation existed, but it was it seemed so far away from um, what they needed to do in, in practice. Um, the, the comments that have been discussed earlier, you know, how you assess costs and benefits, how do you evaluate success, you know, what should monitoring look like? Were, were all questions that were that were being asked, you know, and, and we hope that we've gone some way to answering within the within the note. So again, I'm not going to go through through all of these. Um, the, the, there's some common themes that 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 did come up around um, who you know who's responsible, um, when should opportunities be considered. Um, and you know, information available to understand costs and benefits. So if we go on to this, this slide just, just outlines um, some of the actions that we've identified that I think we, we've taken away and we hope um, other organisations and all of you there today um, you know, take away and think about. Um, you know, how do we, how do we, how do we um, realise some of these actions? Um, you know, all with the aim, as I said, said from the start, of, of, of getting ecological enhancement implemented as a sort of business as usual case um, on a large, you know, a larger scale than has been done done to date. Um, so again, I, I'll leave those up. I'm not going to go through them all, but the, there's there's quite a bit in there about involving evolving communities, involving people early. Um, there are various funding opportunities out there. You know, it doesn't have to be money taken away from a from another um, you know another source. Um, but the, but there's also again you know the, the the knowledge sharing aspect. You know, how, 
are we doing all we can to publicize and celebrate some of the successes that 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 we've had um you know can organizations do more to identify individuals to champion um this this type of work and and promote it within the organizations so i think that's all i'm going to say but again i'll just say a a, a thank you from um you know, from from me and us at Arup, we've we very much enjoyed supporting the EcoStructure project, um, and yeah, like like others, looking forward to um, see what 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 we can do next.